The resurrection of Jesus Christ is heaven's radical solution to the enormous problem called death. He is the Word of God, a prophet, a servant. He is the bread of life, the shepherd and the lamb. He is the messenger. He is the humble king. He is the Son of God. He was rejected and abandoned. He was betrayed and condemned. He was mocked and beaten, bruised and pierced. He was crucified and buried. But the nails could not hold him. The cross could not finish him. The stone could not keep him. Death could not defeat him. He is our ransom and our redeemer. our deliverer and our refuge. He is mighty. He is glorious. He is holy and exalted. He is our Savior. And He is risen. Hi, and thank you for joining us for the Venture Online Experience. Happy Easter. Will you pray with us? Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you for your forgiveness, your love, the grace that you give us each and every day. We worship you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
greetings to you on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. You know, I think you would agree with me. There's not a single event in human history that even comes close to changing the world like the wonderful good news of that empty tomb. It changed my life, and I'm sure it's changed yours as well. Here's why. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is heaven's radical solution to the enormous problem called death. I mean, death is everyone's problem, and it's one that we would all like to find a way of escape. Let me tell you a story. A father and his five-year-old son were driving past a cemetery, and the little boy looks out the window, and he notices a big, large pile of dirt right next to a freshly dug grave. He gets all excited, and he shouts to his dad, and he says, Dad, Dad, look, one got out. See, the truth is, death is everyone's problem, and it's a problem that we all want to escape. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or you've heard about it, but guess where the world's super rich are investing their money these days? They're investing billions in the science of longevity, biological reprogramming technology. That's a fancy way of saying they don't want to die. They would give anything to find a way to live forever. But you see, the truth be told, and believed there is a way. Jesus solved that problem once and for all, for all who would believe. Today, on this Resurrection Sunday, we're going to do a deep dive into the resurrection story. And then we're going to conclude with six life-changing truths about the resurrection that will transform your life. So, let's get into it. We begin today in Mark's Gospel, and we're going to begin with the burial. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 42. So it was preparation day, the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, he went boldly to Pilate, and he asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. So summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he had learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. And then he, then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So here you have it. Joseph of Arimathea, a Pharisee, a, a member, a prominent member of the Jewish Sanhedrin and a believer in Jesus Christ. He asked Pilate for the body. Now, you, you, you read the story. You've heard the story. But, but, the, but there's one interesting thing that I'd like to point out to you about this account in fact, all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all reveal an extraordinary amount of information about the tomb. From the four Gospels, we learn that the tomb was Joseph's tomb. Joseph of Arimathea, it was his personal tomb. We learn that it was a new tomb. We also learn that it was near the crucifixion site, right in a garden, right by the crucifixion site is where the tomb was located. And finally, number four, all, the, all of the gospel writers want you to know that it was a freshly cut tomb right out of the rock. Right out of the rock? Well, why is that important for us to know? I think it's very important the disciples wanted you to know that there was absolutely no chance that someone snuck in from a back door. This was a freshly cut tomb out of the rock, meaning there's only one way in and one way out. But there's one very important final bit of information in the burial story. I mean, just in case you wondered, did the women perhaps end up at the wrong tomb? No way. These faithful women who watched him die, Mark says that they were there watching as he's buried. 
they knew exactly the tomb location. Wrong tomb, no chance. Let's go now to Matthew's gospel. He gives us a, another very important detail for our consideration. It's called the guard at the tomb. Matthew 27, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I'll rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went. And they, they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Interesting story. The next day, the next day after Jesus' burial. Now, what day would that be? Well, he's buried on Friday, so the next day would be Saturday. But get this. The next day, Saturday, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they go to Pilate and they ask for extra security on Saturday. Oh, well, wait a minute. That's Passover. That's Sabbath. This is their... This is their sacred holiday. They were supposed to be at the temple, not meeting with Pilate. I mean, surely that, that must break some kind of Jewish law. But Pilate agrees. And he tells them, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they do. They put a Roman seal on the stone, and they post not a guard, but the guard. You see, the guard, a Roman guard, was a 16-man unit, armed, trained, dangerous. Fall asleep on the job, you're dead. See, Matthew wants you to know that there is no way that someone stole the body from the tomb. But let's journey on in our story. Let's travel now to that first morning, and let's follow the women to the tomb. In Matthew 20, 28, it was after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel sat on it. Don't miss that. Verse 3, his appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook, and they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. So come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples when suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They, they clasped his feet and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, I don't know if you even realize this. Maybe you do. Maybe you've read the stories multiple times. But the resurrection stories, the account of the empty tomb, can be confusing. Why? Well, the reason is because the gospel accounts are different. Not in the majors, you know, Jesus rises from the dead, but there are some pretty major differences. Let me share two of them with you. The first one is the time of day. See, Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree that it was at dawn, you know, early in the morning, just after sunrise, they say, when Mary makes her famous journey to the tomb. But John says something different. In John 20, verse 1, he says 
that Mary journeyed to the tomb while it was still dark. Now, there's a big difference between darkness and dawn. The dawn clearly has light. The darkness does not. The second difference, it has to do with the angels. Let me tell you some of those differences. Matthew and Mark record one angel, one angel conversation, whereas Luke and John say that there were two angels. Now, they agree on their appearance. They're, they all agree that they, were, that they were dazzling white like lightning in appearance. And they all basically agree on the message of the angel. You know, the angel says four things. Don't fear. He's not here. He's risen. Come and see where he, where he, he lay. And then go tell the disciples. Go tell the disciples. So the messaging is the same. The number of angels, different. Let me say to you, the, the number of angels is very easy to reconcile. Matthew and Mark, they don't say that there weren't two angels. They just report the words of the one angel, the angel that spoke most of the message. But where the real head-scratcher comes in is in Matthew's account of the story. See, Matthew records the angel this angel who comes down, rolls away the stone, and sits on top of the stone, while Mark, Luke, and John all say that Mary's conversation with the angel took place inside the tomb. Big difference. One angel sits on top of the stone. The other stories, the angel conversation happens inside the tomb. So how do you reconcile these differences? Well, I'm here to tell you that I suggest a very simple solution to the problem. F forgive me for using this expression. Some of you will know what I mean by this, but Matthew's telling of the story is a Tarantino-style telling without the profanity. The events that Matthew tells are not listed chronologically, not in order. Like, well, what do I mean? Well, if you want to make sense of the story, if, if you want to reconcile Matthew's story with the other three, you have to understand that the events of verses 2, 3, and 4 happen in a different place in the story. The angel coming down, the rolling away of the stone, the, sitting, the earthquake, the sitting on top of the stone do not happen after Mary arrives. It happens before now, I'm not saying those things didn't happen. I'm just saying to you that Mary didn't see that part of the story. That part of the story happened before she got there. She was not a witness to the violent earthquake. She didn't see the angel of the Lord come down and roll away the stone. She had no conversation with the angel on top of the stone. She did not see Jesus walk out of the tomb. That happened before she got there. Okay. She didn't see it. I agree. But who did? Well, clearly the guards saw it. It was their testimony. Verses 2, 3, and 4 is the story of the guards. It's what they told the chief priests. So where do these verses fit in the story? 2, 3, and 4. Well, these events took place earlier in the morning, before Mary and her friends arrive at the tomb. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to put those verses in their chronological order, and I'd like to read those first five, five verses with you, beginning with verse 2. And then you'll see what I mean. Verse 2, there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Now, verse 1, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. 
You see, Mary never saw the angel on the stone. The guards did. Mary saw the angel inside the tomb. Now, once you've resolved this tension, you now have perfect harmony with all the gospel accounts. So what happened to the guards? Well, Matthew tells their story. In Matthew 28, continuing in verse 11, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city. And they reported to the chief priests everything that happened. That's verses 2, 3, and 4. So when the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan. And they gave the soldiers a, a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So some of the guards report back to the chief priest. What do they say? Well, they, the testimony is in verses 2, 3, and 4. But I want you to think about this for a minute. A man has just returned from the dead, and the, the soldiers report to their leaders, the political powers of the day, and what do they choose to do with this massively important information? They hush it up with hush money. Not much has changed in 2,000 years, has it? But, but there's still one final detail that I'd like to reconcile with you, and that's the time of day. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say that Mary traveled there at dawn. John says it was still dark. Well, the solution is simple. The women made two trips to the tomb. It's what the Scripture says, once in the dark and once at the dawn. Now, I promise, I'm not just making this up. Read John's Gospel, and you'll see for yourself. What I'd like to do for the first time in my 35 years of preaching this story, I'd like to tell you the best as I understand the chronological order, the events of that morning. Number one, in the early morning darkness, a violent earthquake, a dazzling angel rolls away the stone and takes his seat upon that stone. When Jesus walks out of the tomb, the guards pass out like dead men. Now, while it's still dark, Mary and her friends make their first journey to the tomb in darkness, wondering how they're going to move the stone. But when they arrive, the stone is already rolled away. Bewildered, they run to tell the disciples. Now, it's just after sunrise. First light, Peter and John race for the tomb as fast as they can. Upon arrival, they step into the empty tomb. They examine the strips of linen and the head cloth. Peter and John, bewildered, walk out. And they begin to make their way back to the other disciples. But as they walk out, the women are there in the mouth of the tomb, standing outside the tomb, weeping. They're there because they had followed Peter and John back to the tomb for the second time at dawn. Mary, after the, after the disciples are gone, Mary steps into the tomb to see for herself and there she has her dazzling encounter with the angel. There are two of them, one seated at the head and the other at the foot of the tomb. And they look like young men, but only one speaks or does most of the talking. And he says, don't fear. See for yourself, he's not here, he's risen. Go tell the disciples, go to Galilee and he will meet you there. And finally, as the women turn in their exuberance and make way back to the disciples, there he is. Jesus meets them. The rest of the story is, is history. Many years ago, one of my professors at Asbury Seminary, Dr. J.T. Siemens, a missionary professor, told a story in class one day that I will never forget. It was the story of an African Muslim who became a Christian. His family and friends were horrified. 
They said, how is it possible that you've rejected the, the faith of your family and you have become a Christian, a follower of Jesus? He answered, it's like this. Suppose you were going down the road and suddenly the road forked in two directions and you didn't know which way to go, but there at the fork were two men, one dead and one alive. Who would you follow? I'd like to share with you in our final moments together, I'd like to share with you right from Scripture six life-changing truths about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number one, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, your faith is a fact. See, the Apostle Paul said, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith is meaningless. We, we should be pitied, he said, above all people. But if that tomb was empty, then there are no empty promises now. Everything Jesus said, everything that he did, everything that he promised, is a fact. Your faith is rooted in an historical event that really truly happened. Number two, if Jesus rose from the grave, from the dead, your, your death is swallowed up. The Apostle Paul says that, that our death has been consumed, swallowed up in victory. Like, like the old song says, there ain't no grave gonna hold this body down. Death is dead. All those billions of dollars that the billionaires are spending on longevity, all they'd have to do is just believe and live forever. Number three, if Jesus rose from the dead, then your body is imperishable, or one day it will be. The Apostle Paul said these perishable bodies are going to be clothed with imperishable. The mortal shall become immortal. You know those aches and pains that you have? You know that bad knee, that high blood pressure? Well, one day it will be gone, gone, gone. The imperishable awaits us. Number four, if, if Jesus rose from the dead, your hope is living, living. It's living because Jesus is alive. Because he's alive today, we have hope for tomorrow. Real hope, not just wishful thinking, but real hope. Hope that one day when we close our eyes in this life, we will open them to a wonderful new world, a world where the sun never sets and where our troubles never even get off the ground. Speaking of trouble, if, if Jesus rose from the dead, number five, then your troubles are momentary. See, the resurrection of, of Jesus adds a whole new dimension to this world's problems. The, the Apostle Paul said that in comparison to what awaits us, he says, what's happening here is pretty small. So fix your eyes on what's up there and stop fixating your heart on what's down here. Finally, number six, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, your world is underfoot. Now wait, what do you mean? Well, we're, we're living in frightening days. We're watching the enemies dismantle society. They're wreaking unbelievable havoc. They seem to be unstoppable. Where's Jesus in all of this? Well, the Bible says that he's at the right hand of the Father. And guess where his enemies are? They are under his foot. The Apostle Paul said, you just wait and you watch. Jesus is alive at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for you, and everything is under control. Let me conclude today by encouraging you to, to believe this most important truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. In fact, your faith in the resurrection may be the most important thing about you. Why? Because this event will impact both your life here and your eternity there. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 9 and, excuse me, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, he said, if you will declare with your mouth 
that Jesus is Lord. And if you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have, have you made that most profound confession with your mouth? If, if you haven't, say it with me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And now, do you believe that in your heart? Do you believe with all of your strength, with all of your might, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that God the Father raised His Son, Jesus Christ, back to life? Do you believe that? The Bible says, if you do, you too will be saved. And all of the promises are yours. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you on this beautiful resurrection day as we celebrate the greatest story, the greatest story ever revealed. Father, we pray that you would touch our hearts. We simply want to confess with our mouth that we believe Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts with all of our might that you raised him from the dead. We confess our sins. We, we pray for this crazy world. We're grateful that you are at the right hand of the Father and that it's all in your control. Bless your church. Help us to spread this gospel story throughout all of the world. We love you. We proclaim you as, as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we confess our love and adoration to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Resurrection Day with family and friends. And I'll look forward to seeing you back here next Sunday for the continuation of our Deep Dive series. Love you guys and have a blessed day.